Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And we are an ADA SERP approved CE center that focuses on hands-on courses. And today we are going to discuss the preparation for tooth number 18 MO on the Acadental type and on it. So let's get started. 330 burr, this is really the go-to burr for starting class 1's, class 2's, class 3's, and we are going to start this preparation on the mesial since it's an MO and place the burr about at the height of the marginal ridge and go down 1.5 and then we're just going to follow the fissures back. Keep the burr perpendicular to the occlusal table. The occlusal table being defined as a, an imaginary plane that would lay on top of the cusps of this tooth. And because this tooth tips in lingually following you know, the curve of Wilson, we are going to have to make a conscious effort to keep the burr tipped slightly lingually as well. So this is the initial slit down the occlusal surface and we're going to go ahead and extend about a millimeter up the buccal fissure and the lingual fissure. And then after this, we're going to have to widen the proximal just a little bit uh, so that we can now use our 245 burr to drop the proximal box. The 245 burr is great for this. It's uh, been designed for this particular purpose. It's three millimeters in length and it has the same width as the 330 burr. You can hold the burr up against the side of the tooth and decide how far down the burr is going to go apically or gingivally uh, and get an idea of how far you need to push before you break gingival contact and it's just a way to save time so if you hold the burr up along the side of the tooth you can get an idea oh gosh I'm going to have to go down the full length of the flutes on this one and you can punch down there pretty quickly without fear of punching all the way through it's just a time saver so we're just showing you the initial slit that we make in the box area and then we've got a ways to go still. One thing I want to point out that is oftentimes uh, not understood is that the, the wall that is adjacent to the functional cusp is going to be slightly acute relative to the gingival where the lingual is going to make a 90 degree angle relative to the gingival. And uh, this will provide us with retention in the box. But we're not going to have both the lingual and the facial walls convergent. One wall will be 90 degrees relative to the gingival. And the facial wall will be, will be convergent. And this really just follows the natural contours of the contact zone. And we're just going to go a little bit further gingerly or apically. And then we're going to take a look at this and see how we've broken through. Yeah, we have. And that small little area that we're breaking through is a really good sign for letting us know that we're awfully close. So the the next step would be to utilize hand instrumentation to break that away, that little shell that has protected the distal tooth number 19. And we can use the 10714 enamel hatchet for this particular purpose. The hatchet measures one millimeter wide and has a primary and a secondary cutting edge. I like to use both the primary and secondary cutting edges when doing a class two preparation. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to place the hand instrument and just rotate it towards tooth number 19 and just break off that little shell that is protecting the tooth from the burr. But we're ready to move on to extending the box. So now you can see the broken through the gingival just a little bit and we have these undermined areas on the facial and the lingual which are going to need to be chopped away as well. And without putting the burr in there, I'm going to use the hand instrument now, and I'm going to push down with a little bit of force at the proper exit angle. So we're maintaining that 90 degree exit angle, and we're going to push it downward towards the gingival. One thing you've got to watch out for is, and this happens to me occasionally, is that when I'm working on plastic teeth anyway, is that uh, the instrument can scrape up against the adjacent tooth. So one of the ways you can prevent that is simply by going a little deeper axially with your burr before you place your hand instrument in, in position. Right now, I need to extend the facial wall more facially. Well, how do we do this without hitting the adjacent tooth? And the answer is undermine and chip. 
It's this two-step process where we use the burr, probably about half the diameter of the burr towards the facial, on the inside there near the axial wall, and then we create this little hook, this bird beak that exists now at, at the facial side. Having this bird beak now, we can take that and just push down again with the instrument with the long end of the hatchet facing towards the facial and the proper exit angle, and we can remove that undermined area. And it may require a couple of, uh, of attempts with the hatchet, and you've got to have a really good sharp enamel hatchet or off-angle chisel for this particular purpose. So you can see that we need to extend both the facial and the lingual. If we need to extend the gingival, a great way to do that is by using the burr in much the same way we did it on the facial just then and create a little ditch along the gingival and then just take the instrument and push it over like this. A little technique I like to call the little Sturdivant chip. He advocates this technique in his textbooks on creating a little shelf and then chipping it away with a hand instrument. So we have some extensions to fix. Some areas are less uh, extended than others, so we need to very, be very careful now, very mindful of the areas that are uh, smaller and the areas that are larger in terms of clearance, and focus on the areas that are underextended to get them to have the same amount of extension as the areas that have more extension. And this is the slow part of the class too. This is the part that takes a little bit of effort, uh, a lot of focus. We're chipping away a little gingival here and now we're going to go ahead and get the exit angles proper again. I think that if you have to struggle too much on chipping this away, you probably either have a dull instrument or you haven't created enough of a bird beak. Many of you are familiar with these instruments, the RGS 1, 2, and 3, 4. They're used by thousands of students around the world, and they're great for determining the extensions on many different preparations, and I mentioned these in several of my videos. The one we're going to utilize first is the RGS 1, and the RGS 1 is 0.4 millimeters in diameter, and class 2 should be anywhere from about 0.3 to 0.5, so if the instrument just almost fits, or if it fits just slightly, you're right on the money. And the other thing the instrument can be used for is the depth. And this is the pulpal depth. And the instrument measures 1.5 millimeters in length, so you can use it for that particular purpose as well. So it's, it's, it's quite versatile for the class two or class one, or even class three evaluations. You can see that we've made the extent, oh, I'm sorry, here's the RGS-3, uh, which is one millimeter, and we're measuring the depth of the axle, or you could say the gingival width, and it's a little more than one millimeter. And this is the RGS-4, and this measures 1.5, and you can see that this does not fit. So we know that we're under extended axially, and we need to move the burr more axially, more towards the center of the tooth, in order to get the proper axial depth. I didn't say axial you know, or gingival extension, I talked about axial depth. In other words, we're going to push the burr closer to the pulp in that direction, and that's referred to as axial depth. Oftentimes people refer to that as the width of the gingival wall or gingival floor, but really the proper terminology would be axial depth. And I'm using the 330 RGS. This is a terrific burr for making all of the internal line angles more defined. It doesn't make them sharp, but it makes them more defined. And it also has a very flat end on it, unlike the th regular 330. And so it can be used to create really nice flat walls. And we uh, worked on this burr for a long time to get everything just right. It measures two millimeters in length. So you can see how when it sticks up above the, the, the preparation there, you can see that your depth is, is not too deep. And you can use this to round off corners. I've got some work to do still on those corners, but it's great for rounding off these edges and creating the S-curve even without deepening the pulpal. And that is amazing because most of the time when you're using like a 330, uh, you end up going deeper pulpally and you end up creating a little bit of a negative, a little dip in the pulpal wall. Uh, this burr doesn't do that. You say, well, why not use a 55 burr? A 55 burr is it's narrow, it's clean. Uh, with a couple problems. 55 burr is too sharp on the end. It creates very sharp internal line angles, which are not favorable for amalgams or composites. 
and also it's not convergent. So you lose your convergency or you end up tipping the pulp wall at an angle if you try to make uh, all these internal forms clean with the 55. I have never seen a proper preparation done with a 55 burr. And uh, I'll give anybody a free type it on if they can show me one that was done with a 55 burr that meets the criteria of an ideal class 2 prep. So if that's the technique you're using, I would encourage you to think outside the box a little bit and also think logically about what it is that class 2 is trying to accomplish. So the preparation is nearly completed. We just have a little bit of fine-tuning to do. Uh, you can use a secondary cutting edge to go up against the axial. We can get the axial wall uh, a little bit uh, more convex. We can sharpen line angles internally that need to be sharpened. We can make the axial pulpal bevel and remove any rough spots along the pulpal wall as well. So the burr does uh, most of the defining, but it's the hand instruments that do the refining. And you can see that now we're more than one millimeter and yet we are just slightly less than 1.5. That is right on the money. And uh, if you were to look at other features like the extensions, they're falling in that range of 0.3 to 0.5. Our depth is okay. Uh, it's pretty smooth. It's not perfect, but it looks like this would be uh, a very acceptable preparation if you're studying for the bench exam or maybe a dental school examination I think that you would you would do really well so let's just take a, a final look at that axial pulpal we definitely want to have that slightly beveled or rounded some schools ask for rounded or beveled would be uh, an acceptable alternative to rounded we just don't want the amalgam to have a stress point there and uh, we can take off little irregularities on the occlusal as well. So one final look with the RGS-1. You can see that we're just slightly shy on that one and just a little bit over on that side. So probably 0.45 on the facial and 0.35 on the lingual in terms of extension. And our depth is right in that 1.5 to 2 millimeter range. You can see a 1 millimeter isthmus just barely fits right there and perhaps about a one millimeter extension up the buckle in lingual side as well. So it's nice to be able to look at the preparation and check everything one last time to make sure everything's okay. And it looks like this preparation turned out reasonably well. There was a little bit of damage on the distal of tooth number 19. And all I did to fix that was just use a soft flex disc and the finest soft flex disc just ran it over a little bit and that removed the damage that was there. So, uh, thank you for watching. I love this little guy, uh, and uh, he's a good operator because he follows the recommendations.